Hello and welcome to the Friday, November 17th, 2023 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. I did a very brief diary today about a TCP dump and, well, how to speed it up a little bit. So many people are using TCP dump day in, the day out, but, you know, you often don't really bother looking at sort of the details of the command line options. The most obvious thing to speed TCP dump up is usually the use of the dash N switch to prevent reverse lookups, and that's a good idea for a number of uh, reasons, not just uh, for speed, but there are a couple of other command line options that do affect speed. And the two that probably matter the most here is Q and T. Q will uh, just make uh, TCP dump quieter, so basically produce less output. With that, of course, TCP dump also has to analyze less, and uh, that uh, gave sort of about... Uh, 30% or so a performance gain. The other option may not be that obvious. That's T. T disables display of the timestamp. And the timestamp should be pretty straightforward and uh, simple to analyze, uh, but also sort of gets you a 25 to 30% performance gain if you are turning off displaying the timestamp. And then of course, best if you disable both timestamps and run it in quiet mode, which gets you about a 50% speed, speed improvement. Now, the quiet option is not always uh, appropriate because you really see a lot less details about the packet, pretty much just sort of IP addresses and uh, maybe ports. So the T option, I think, is really something to keep in mind if you want to speed up things a little bit with TCP dump. Now, this was just a quick test on my M1 Mac. If you get different numbers, uh, please uh, let me know. Then we got the blog post by the Google Threat Analysis Group with details regarding exploits against a Simpra zero-day vulnerability. Now, this hasn't happened recently. Google observed that in June. In July, the vulnerabilities were being patched. It's still interesting to see how, in this case, a cross-site scripting vulnerability was exploited. This was exploited against foreign governments, and there is always the question, why does a foreign government use an open source a mail server like Simpra for uh, their particular uh, email uh, service? Well, it uh, comes back down to what choices you really have. You can run traditionally uh, on-premise email services often with Exchange uh, to create something similar. Well, Exchange had its own problems. Many commercial organizations are moving to cloud, but as a foreign government, you may not necessarily want to sign up with a US-based cloud service, which then I think pushes a lot of these organizations to adopt open source solutions like Simpra that are very functional, but well, is just like anything else, uh, do need to be patched, do need to be monitored. A lot of people uh, talk about AI and machine learning security that are usually talking about exploits like prompt injection, but the real big problem with these tools is often the tools used to build the models. So basically the back end of uh, these AI and machine learning operations. Protect AI, a company as the name implies, is in the AI security business, has now set up a GitHub repository that they call AI exploits. And what it is is essentially a collection of uh, exploits against these kind of backend systems that are commonly used for machine learning, Nmap scripts and the like in order to help you identify uh, vulnerable uh, systems that you may have in your environment. I think it's a great head start kind of if you are getting into machine learning in your organization to sort of be a little bit more proactive and figuring out that the system deployed are somewhat secure. And then there are two vulnerabilities that I want you to be aware of in particular given that uh, 
in the US here next week will be sort of a big holiday week. First one is Fortinet. Forty seem suffers from an OS command injection vulnerability. Luckily found internally by a Fortinet, but they still needs to be patched. It's one of those uh, API vulnerabilities where an exposed API can be abused by an unauthenticated attacker to execute arbitrary commands. These issues tend to be very easy to exploit. Of course, no details yet about what the exact nature of the vulnerability is. And the second one is actually not a new vulnerability, but uh, more well, details regarding the vulnerability. Crush FTP, uh, the vulnerability was patched back in August, but really wasn't sort of made a big deal about. Apparently there are now some exploits being used in the wild and a Converge Technology Solutions has published a blog with uh, details regarding this vulnerability and how to exploit it to gain remote code execution access to the Crush FTP server. Well, I haven't done it in a while, but we do have, again, one of our sans.edu students to talk about his research paper, Scott Poli. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name's Scott Poli. Uh, I am uh, currently work at Cyborg Security as a uh, senior threat hunter and content developer. Um, but my you know background has really been in, in most areas in security across the board. So I've uh, been in technical and leadership roles. So uh all that experience kind of drove me towards the focus of the topic today with the paper I wrote. That paper, I, I love the title. We're storing less, discovering more. It's something that you know, close to my heart is a lot of organizations really store a ton of data they never look at. And that's, mm -hmm. of course, never a lot of the pain and the cost sort of comes from with the traditional SIEM deployments and things like that. So uh, what is this all about? What, what did you find here? Yeah, so um, really what drove me t towards this was really two um, experiences I actually had within cybersecurity. And one was a challenge on trying to analyze a boatload of proxy data. Um, and where I worked at the time, we were collecting about 8 million records a day. And I was supposed to figure out how to build some analytics and do things with that. And it just seemed daunting. But when I started digging into the data, I noticed there was a lot of duplicate data um, that presided there. And when we distilled it down, there was really only about 20,000 unique domains within that 8 million records. And so uh, based on that, I realized that even day to day, that number got even smaller. So it became a much easier uh, challenge to tackle. And then, you know, trying to look at different technologies to actually do analytics and understand relationships within data. I got, I fell in love with Bloodhound very quickly. Um, you know, the Active Directory attack path mm -hmm. discovery tool. And one of the reasons why was how it presented its findings using graph databases. By doing so, it was very easy to understand really complex data. Um, and I found I was able to understand our environment. Even I was in an environment where there's multiple acquisitions. So we understand Active Directory can get very cloudy and muddy as far as um, what you're looking at. And I had a better understanding than a lot of the people that were responsible for managing it. So basically, I kind of took those two concepts on, there's a lot of data out there that we have to deal with in cybersecurity, but I understand a lot of it's really duplicate data. And how can we maintain the value in all the records and the transactional stuff, as well as maintain all the context by maybe storing things differently, trying a different approach? Yeah, so about those domains, did you find that basically it's not really worthwhile storing everybody's access to Google or uh, how do you sort of approach that? Well, so with the domain data stuff on that and that venture, um, that was really about enriching things with the Alexa top million and then with Alexa rank rankings because we understood that they are just things that would stand out like a sore thumb based on people's natural way to um, understand the data. Within this research, I really focused on authentication and process creation data because with those two data sets, one, everyone collects them in security. You know, it's a pretty yeah. standard set of data. And they're also very verbose and voluminous when it comes to the collection. Like there's a lot of data there to validate if this approach maybe might work um, with what I was trying to do. Yeah. So authentication, was it like about authentication failures or what? What was the value there of the data that you found or what is what you look so 
what was interesting with authentication data was just the amount of data you can save and still maintain the what actually occurred. So with my approach, for instance, um, you know, I had about 46,466 uh, records with within the, my data sets for the research. And that got distilled down to about 598 nodes within Neo4j with the duplicate, duplicate data. So a much more manageable size. But what I kept in like the properties of the context of that, you know, I would record an authentication record based on the logon type as well as the username. And maybe if they're using administrative tokens or not, you know, that data that's included in the record, that's what I had in the graph database, but all the transactional data, like the session IDs or the time um, stamp of the record went into a MySQL database. And so by using those together, I was able to maintain the context and the transactional data and store a lot less. Um, and um, so there's a lot of value just in that alone. And the graph database, did you find that that helped sort of also identify anomalies and such as, does that make that easier? Or? So with the graph database, what was really um, interesting and in how I stored it was every time there was an occurrence in the data, those relationships between nodes, I'd add basically increase a weight. And by increasing the weight, you can determine what was more normal or common based on behaviors and what was more rare. And so just with that increase in weight and then be able to run analytics to say, hey, give me where we have rare executions or where authentic rare authentications with certain users, things would stand out. And then I was able to then basically do a couple additional queries to say, well, give me the session for that weird event. And then I would be able to visually see the story and the context that typically I feel like in security, we're always trying to stitch together anyways. Um, but it was very clear and easy to just present it all at once, which I thought had a lot of value as well. So that's neat. So you basically use the graph database and then the MySQL database, what they're strong at, you know, what, they, what they're mm -hmm. good at, instead of trying to shoehorns of the entire problem into one of these solutions. Right. Yeah. And uh, any other sort of data that you used to enrich this, like in, in addition to the login data, or did you just focus on the login data itself? Uh, so... Yeah, I had the process data so you can kind of see from start to finish what users were executing what within the environment and then also what processes were related to each other um, for rare executions and things like that. Uh, and so I did some of the same rarity exercises outside of just when people logged in or how they logged in um, and went into what processes were rare to maybe a host or to an application or to just process execution in general. And I think that is interesting in itself because when you look at hosts, sometimes you have purpose-built servers or, or things that only will be doing certain activities. And over time, especially with a weighted solution, you can say what's rare or obscure. Um, and same thing with applications. One of the things I know with looking at vulnerabilities, a lot of times when something's exploited, the behavior of that whole application changes. And this is an easy way, I think, to identify that as well, potentially catching zero days or where people are trying to take advantage of applications. That's that's pretty a neat uh, idea, actually. I was just thinking that, you know, uh, patch levels and such, if you're looking mm -hmm. like at library relationships that may be different, we sort of have one system that sticks out from all the others because you forgot to patch that, that would be sort of a nice extension of that. Uh, any plans with that? Any further research or so that you think about doing here? Yeah. So the one thing as I was going through the research was trying to come up with what was what would be like an onboarding process to add more data to the data sets as far as figuring out, well, how do I want to relate things together naturally, um, as well as what would be the onboarding costs. So one thing that was interesting that I discovered, but just looking at process data and authentication data was I would have multiple records in the MySQL database for a process log, um, purely based on I'm storing all the a context and as far as session IDs and all the relationship uh, UUIDs I created within the graph database to make it easy to find things. But I had more records there and less when I looked at authentication logs in the MySQL database. And it really showed me that, well, there's more value in the process data. So I'm paying more for the storage, but at least I'm paying more for something of value versus just paying that cost of storage for things that maybe aren't going to provide any value. So Part of that exercise on how to onboard data was going to kind of discover, well, how does that really shake out when I add new data sources as far as cost goes? Am I gaining anything from this or not? Um, so that was a next approach. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so 
thanks a lot uh, for joining me here. And uh, are you almost done with the program now or any class? Yeah, I, I graduated in October, so... Well, always good to hear that our students are graduating. So thanks for joining me here. Just as a reminder, there will be no podcast next week. I'll take the Thanksgiving week off. So thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for subscribing. Haven't really gotten any reviews uh, for the last month, I think. So if you haven't done that yet, uh Check into your favorite podcast platform and leave a review. And uh, thanks, uh, everybody here, for listening. Talk to you again after Thanksgiving. Bye.